As you might have noticed in the program, uh, the name of my presentation is Dionys Lenar and Ladislav Junger, refugees from Lublin area and their effort to inform about genocide. The contribution is focused on two refugees. What you see is a part of my presentation, a graphic part of my presentation. I was also successful in finding quite unique and some already known pictures and documents. So, from 25th March to 20th October 1942, 57,000 Jews were transported in 57 transport from Slovakia. Transport with the Slovak Jews went to Auschwitz camp and to Lublin area. To Auschwitz we had 19 transports and to Lublin area we had 38 transports, altogether including 39,000 Jews. The majority of them were slaughtered and murdered and the unmistakable fact is that in the Lublin area the greatest part of Jewish population from Slovakia was murdered. So we are remembering their message uh, of the refugees from the camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. We are talking about the story of Alfred Wetzler and Rudolf Verba. They escaped the Nazi war machine from Lublin area almost two years before Betzler and Verba in the summer 1942, talking about Dionys Lenard and Ladislav Junger. They were also, just as Betzler and Verba, from Slovakia and they decided to escape at any cost and warn their colleagues and what these transport really meant. So what is different in their story and, and what uh, are they similar to the story of Betzler and Verba? This, is, this will be the topic of my presentation. What kind of information did they proceed to the public and what happened with them after? So one distinction from the beginning. In the case of Mr. Lenard and Junger, we're talking about two uh, particular refugees, so they were not escaping together. It's two different stories. Mr. Lenard from Žilina was deported from Novaki to concentration camp Lublin. Ladislav Junger originated from Sabinova, was deported from Presho, and his transport did not go directly to Lublin, but one of the ghettos in Lublin area. Mr. Lenard was deported in 1942, so in the time where the regime deported young Jewish men and women who were able to work, so to speak. Lenard's transport left to Lublin on 30th March of 1942. Vladislav Junger was deported later, on 22nd of um, May 1942, in so-called family transport, where people were put together without bearing in mind their age or gender. This transport uh, departed on 1942 from uh, municipalities on eastern Slovakia and was placed by SS in a particular ghettos in Lublin area. There were empty locations where uh, these were facilities that housed uh, the Jews uh, from Poland before. So both Lander and Junger were in the Lublin area where the Nazi members did not have uh, capacities to murder and exterminate all the Jews. So some camps, just uh, for example Majdanek, uh, who were using the labor as slaves, uh, were finishing these facilities. So let's uh, look at them particularly. So here we have a story of Mr. Lenard, and it is quite extensive. Mr. Lenard had 31 years when he was deported. He was born 1912 in Budapest.
His father Adolf originated from Czech and mother Teresa from Hungary. At the First World War they moved to Zhilina. His father was Zionist. The family wanted to settle in the 30s in Palestine. Downies in the year 1933 moved illegally to Palestine and in Tel Aviv worked as a waiter. Two years later he was followed by his mother and father along with uh, sister Rachel. Brits, however, deported them back to Czechoslovakia. Basing on these memories uh, fr from his memoirs, we know that in 1937 he was in Prague where he presented himself as a waiter from Zhilina. His interests were quite unusual for a waiter. He was writing verses, he was using a pseudonym name Karol Lomnitsky and contacted with poets and artists. He was very good in general knowledge and was dedicated towards literature. So when the Slovak state uh, emerged, his sister Rachel, with the help from Zionist, uh, evicted to Denmark in 1939 and later moved to Sweden. Dionys remained in Slovakia and he was hoping to illegally uh, emigrate to Palestine. We know only very few and that is that in 1941 he enlisted himself to working uh, center for Jews in Sveti Kriš. He had his own plans in spite of his uh, conditions. He was engaged and he wanted to get married. In Sveti Kriš nad Hrono, uh, he received an information the Jews will be deported from Slovakia. It was quite clear that this also involved him. Later on he wrote that uh, the paper he received uh, basically sounded as a seasonal work. So they escorted him to a concentration uh, center in Novaki. Well, he should be uh, directed towards the transport. He noticed uh, the brutality which the Nazis handled the Jews and also noticed the words of the SS officer who said that if they find some valuable uh, ownership and property uh, after the transport by these Jews, they will be shot on sight. He followed the transport with the terrible conditions to the camp Majdanek. After the arrival in two days without water, uh, they received an offer from the wards to change one glass of water for a suit and later for a golden watch. Leonard asked, how much is human life worth in this place? End quote. We didn't know back then that all this was just a foreplay to what was going to come, a much more brutal reality. So following weeks, Mr. Leonard survived hell. In these facilities we had thousands and thousands of Jews from Slovakia they were here together with the German criminals and Soviet uh, war prisoners. SS members were using the wards of Lithuania and Ukraine and they started quite a brutal regime. They had working commandos from the prisoners, they were still building the camp, they were still working the hard manual labor to sustain its function, but this was still done during the murders, slaughter, no food, and this food only, this food only was in such bad condition that it only further increased the weakness of the organism. So in his report, after he escaped, he wrote, I think that whatever animal had a greater value than we had. He believed that uh, many people died every day and half of these in a natural way, if we can call it naturally, if someone dies by exhaustion. The second half 
died in a violent death. Leonard saw himself as SS member should on site a Slovak Jew who tripped on the lawn of the camp and touched by accident the clothes of the SS member. He immediately saw how they shot a young prisoner who uh, stole a raw potato. He saw where the Slovak Jew approached uh, the fence and he was shot on sight. He talked to the Lublin Jews and he saw a lot of crimes in the several weeks. When his co-prisoner Tibor Schneider asked him, what do you think if he is going to see his wife, whether they are going to come back alive, Ledarn re replied, it's hard to answer you these questions. But if it goes with this pace, we will not survive. Even if they do not shoot us, it is all illusionary. You see that from 50,000 Lublin Jews, we have only 3,000 remaining. Why would they spare us? End of quote. So he decided to escape at any price, at any cost. In his road, in his report, he wrote that apart from his family members, he was thinking of something else. He wanted influence on the powers that are able to forbid the development of this catastrophe. Come to Slovakia at any cost and inform all the Jews that are remaining back in Slovakia on the greatest fraud in history. So, small deviation in his report that was remained. Uh, he clearly states that his aim was to come to Slovakia and inform uh, about what is happening in the concentration camp. In particular part, he was clearly stating that he wants to go from house to house and say what he survived. So although he originally planning was to escape with the two co-prisoners, Strasser and Schlesinger, who were both from Slovakia, when the critical day came, he was alone. On a particular day, on 1942, on an unknown day, he hid himself on a fjord field of the camp, where the camp was divided in the particle field. So, he hid himself beneath the building material. And when the darkness came, he crawled out of the uh, camp. He only had minimal food and resources, so he really had to turn uh, to Jewish population and Polish population for help. Several helped him, several did not. A lot of details of his uh, road and journey were wrote uh, on the pages that were not uh, recovered. However, we know that in the July 1942, Dionys Leonard came to Slovakia. His journey supposed to take 32 days. He did not find his parents there, and they were deported on the 29th of April to Auschwitz, where they both died. Leonard had to hide in Slovakia, of course. The former worker of the Central Office of Jews, who met with Leonard in 1943, reported in 1968 that Leonard uh, was hiding in Slovakia uh, in Banska Bystrica at one doctor who was a father of a co-prisoner uh, of Leonard in Maidan. Hoffman uh, said that this might be misinterpreted that the doctor or the father of this co-prisoner supposed to persuade Leonard to come back to Maidan and give him a large sum of money so he could get his son back. Uh, this even even took place according to Mr. Dvorin, but a lot of historians uh, think this is not really likely, including myself. We do not have any uh, resources at the state. So, on regarding the further fates of Mr. Leonard until the spring of 1943, we know very little. We know that between November 1942 and May 1943, he wrote an extensive 
report on what he survived in Maidan and how he escaped. However, we do not have this uh, now. We only have a part of it. You can see this testimony on the screen. So we can see that on the pages 5 and 6 we have a nexus of two pages. They are evidently on uh, two pages before, so I do believe that from 47 pages uh, material we had before, we still, still a lot of pages are missing, but I will not talk about this because of the shortage of the time. It will be in the written form of my presentation. This testimony is written in form of letter to a friend, and in this letter you can see a plastic report of how the Maidanic camp looked like. This testimony, or a letter if you want, is so truthful and reliable that Leonard really intends to describe what he saw and does not separate it from what he heard and he clearly uh, separates these two categories in his letter. So in comparison to information of Verba and Wessler, there is one clear distinction. Leonard witnessed an early phase of the crime. He was one of the first that were taken to Majdanek camp from Slovakia and he escaped several months earlier uh, before the gas chambers and selections began. He escaped, I think, somewhere around the time where Mr. Ruba was supposed to arrive to camp. So this was in the 30th of 6, 1942, when Berba was uh, moved to transport in Auschwitz. So Leonard saw murder, death from exhaustion, uh, diseases, but not selections and mass murders in gas chambers. In spite of this, I do believe that he saw a lot, so that he can understand that the transport means death, that's why he escaped and wanted to warn people. It is quite clear that information of what he saw was passed on to further people in Slovakia even before he wrote his testimony. I expect that the Jews he met, he informed them. Uh, his informations uh, reached Rabbi Frieder, and a copy of testimony is in the diary of Mr. Frieder. He also informed some other representatives of the working group, although I have to say that I was not able to find any document that would date this or uh, state some further details regarding this action. So as colleague Hradska mentioned that from his testimony, Gizi Fleischmann could work, uh, his work, her work was originally from this, so basically talking about secondary literature here. So the fate of the testimony that is available to us were shifted. So Mr. Hoffman, who was the worker of the central office of the Jews, were offered like this. To Mr. Samuel Hoffman, a man remembered gratefully in Bratislava 26th of 5th, Dionys Lenart. Hoffman testified that this was shortly after Lenart was uh, arrested in Bratislava. He was arrested and imprisoned in the Jewish police uh, headquarters on Göring Street 43, where Hoffman was a representative of the Central Office of Jews. Here Leonard should represent his fate and report. However, Hoffman did incorrectly date this meeting on the year 1944. The next one who talked to Leonard and was reading the testimony or the information you can read in testimony was an artist and caricaturist Stefan Bednar who had a connection with the resistance. For a long time Leonard's testimony was signed with, by a different name, Shano, as you can see on the left side. 
and it was quoted by historians as a testimony of unknown prisoner. Only by the test of time, the Israeli historians were able to identify that the author of the testimony was Dionys Daniel Lenard. Lenard's further fate was quite clear until a couple of years back uh, it was expected that Dionys went to Hungary so that his aim was to move to Hungary. Supposedly he was seen in 1944 in Hungary. It was expected that uh, he was met with the fate of uh, Hungarian Jews who were deported since May 1944 1944 to extermination camp Auschwitz. My research uh, in the framework of this project, Verba and Metzler, uh, clearly shows that this was not the case. Dionys Lenard was imprisoned 8th of June 1943 in the work camp for Jews in Seret. Here he remained until February 1944, whereas we know from his camp uh, held record, he ran away. So down you can see he escaped. So if he moved to Hungary, his uh, stay must have been really, really short. Because in 11th of 8th, he was writing already to his sister to send letters to him to an address of his relatives in Jelina. In a hidden form, he described his fate and that his families his family were deported to uh, nowadays Poland. We don't know the fate of the resistance. Slovakia was occupied by German units and Nazi collabora collaborationists were trying to secure or kill all local Jews. So from November 23rd, 1944, after the Slovak national uprising was suppressed, Mr. Leonard was secured and escorted to concentration camp in Seric. This was under the control of SS and as it is known, it was a center for organizing second wave of deportation of Jews in Slovakia. Even Mr. Leonard was deported from Seric in the transport that reached the concentration camp Sachsenhausen on the 6th December 1944. On the 14th December of 1944, Lenard was imprisoned and dedicated to uh, work for company Heineken. And after a couple of days, he was uh, he was um, directed to work for company Siemens. Then he was deported into concentration camp Buchenwalde where he arrived the 2nd of February 1945. His prison tag ID was 85936. One of the latest documents that I have in my disposal say that Leonard's prisoner number was 7 March 1944, 1945, uh, recorded in the, uh, in the military prison, and the name was Ordruf. So the afterward list of prisoners who uh, survived Buchenwald was the last document with his name. So on this list you can see Lenard's name as well. It's the sixth from the top. It's hard to see it because of the resolution. But I was warned that this source might be unreliable. That these afterward lists can have some mistakes. But we also have to think about the possibility that he even survived until the liberation of the camp 1945 and died shortly after. However, his sister Rachel did not hear from him since 1944 and she never found out that she was imprisoned in the German concentration camp, Sachsenhausen or Buchenwald. So family does not know whether he died and where he died. I would like to say that a couple of days ago I was able to contact with the relatives of Mr. Leonard 
with his niece and I had a conversation with her where this information were passed further on me and they were also, well this lady received these documents from me. So the story of Mr. Leonard is not concluded yet. In the very conclusion you can see there is a lot of to be lot to be verified. So I do believe that within the framework of this project we were able to move forward with the knowledge about this interesting person. If you would let me now, because of the shortage of time, I would like to conclude the information regarding the second refugee, Mr. Junger. Uh, he was born in 1911 and lived in Sabino. He was deported in 1942 in May to a ghetto in Lublin area. He was able to escape there and he came to Sabino where he was recognized by a young guy who reported him and he was arrested and moved to concentration center here in Žilina. He was isolated here for five weeks so he could not come in contact with other prisoners. His further fates are hard to reconstruct. However, at the national at the national court it was documented that Mr. Junger was uh, supposed to give a testimony and he described that he escaped the ghetto in the Lublin area where he found out that the Jews who conducted a similar work as him were murdered into the mass graves. This information were one of those that made the national court decide the further actions. So he had information of physical liquidation of the Jews on the area of today's Poland. Unfortunately, when we talk about Mr. Leonard, I had the possibility to find a lot of uh, unknown documents but Mr. Junger I was not so lucky. I have a lot of problems of finding some crucial information and documents. I really do believe that uh, towards the end of my research that I would like to publicize I will be able to solve these questions. Thank you very much for your attention.